uh, welcome to the day four of our regional conference uh, on the topic the future of work in the new normal uh, jointly organized by REFSA and FES. Uh, thank you for sticking with us. Today is day four, uh, which is also the second last day of this conference. Um, today we have a very interesting lineup of speakers and we will be dwelling into uh, more specifically into the youth perspective in the context of the future work in the new normal. Before we start, um, allow me to um, give you a short recap of what we have discussed yesterday. Yesterday, uh, the topic was uh, gig economy, and we have had the pleasure of having also a line of distinguished speakers from across the region to uh, discuss the topic. Um, we had with we had with us Mr. Nohisham Hussein, who is the Chief Strategic Officer at the Employees Provident Fund in Malaysia. Uh, we also have uh, Mr. Fami Panimba, uh, who is the Resource Associate from the Southern Labor Resource Center in Indonesia. Uh, Mr. Tan Jaigan, the Research Manager of, uh, at the School of Asia School of Business. Uh, as well as the commentator Prof. Boy Lucha, who is uh, from the South China University of Technology, Guangzhou. After the first session, we also had a, the opportunity to listen to some uh, frontliners who has been working very hard throughout the pandemic. Uh, they were Mr. Arif Ashraf, who is the president of the Grab Drivers Association in Malaysia, um, as well as Dr. Rubini Krishnan, uh, who is a medical doctor uh, in Kawal Sabah, Malaysia, uh, one of the most uh, severely affected areas uh, by COVID-19. Um, both of them shared with us some of their uh, challenges and their experience uh, dealing with the crisis. So let me just share with you uh, some slides that I have prepared. And um, okay, I hope you can see my slide right now. Okay, so let me just uh, quickly summarize the, the discussion that we had yesterday. Uh, during the first session, we, um, we talked about the trends on gig economy. We were told that histor historically, informal work is actually nothing new. It was actually the prevalent uh, form of employment in the pre-industrial area. However, we are now dealing with a more complex and volatile world. And uh, as we see uh, companies manage their risk, uh, we have also seen a gradual shift towards temporary employment and contract work um, as a, as a effort for large companies to manage their risk and adjust their employment patterns. Um, the pace of obsolescence of our skills is also unprecedented. The kind of skills that we need um, today and in the future uh, might change and it is definitely very much more temporal than it used to be. There has been more automation uh, which leads to the hollowing out of middle income jobs. There is currently less need for uh, steady, steady manufacturing or office jobs. Globally, there has been a rise in the participation of the gig economy. Uh, we have seen the micro task platform work increase 14% per annum. Um, gig workers are usually well educated male. However, uh, interestingly, in Malaysia, the majority of gig workers are young, highly educated female with a median age of uh, 29 years old. Uh, it's also interesting to note that a large share of the workers are degree holders at about 27.5%, uh, followed by uh, SPM or it is sort of the equivalent of a O-levels holders. Um, gig workers often share uh, some common features and they are uh, one, uncertain working hours, uh, two, blood work-life boundary, three, economic and social insecurity, four, imbalance of power between firms and workers, and five, uh, unequal taxation burden between firms and workers. We were also reminded that uh, apart from the traditional gig workers, there are also uh, digital gig workers 
And indeed, when we talk about gig workers, we are talking about a diverse uh, group of people. Sorry. Sorry, um, let me try to show you again. Okay, so um, in terms of the impact and challenges of gig economy, we have seen that uh, there is a shift from employment-based to employee-based training. The workers are now becoming more responsible for their own reskilling. Um, we have also seen that there's a mismatch of what is available at the job, in the job market and also the labor force at a global scale. Uh, it is interesting to note by one of our speakers that even in a knowledge-based economy, uh, it only produced about 25% of high-skill work. Uh, therefore, it has, it has shown that we need to rethink of our education uh, as the glob globally there has been a push on tertiary education. Um, we need to rethink about it and we need to understand that the future of works requires flexibility in skills and the ability to pivot to different careers. In terms of the social protection for gig workers, while developed countries have better social protection, a lot of countries such as Malaysia uh, have their social protection system built around formal work. Uh, this needs to be changed and in some countries there has already been a conversation about this and regardless of your work, um, the contribution to social protection system is still needed. Uh, by large, the definition, the legal definition of employment, as well as the issue of financing the social protection system is still unresolved, but there is an increasing recognition that more needs to be done at the policy level. Uh, very quickly, um, one of our speakers from Indonesia has given us a rundown on the case of Gojek. Um, so he has um, enlightened us on the situation in Indonesia where there has been a rapid growth of a motorbike taxi or also known as Gojek. And this is in part due to the poor public transport system, um, but also because of the development of smartphone and the renewed policy in telecom telecommunication after Suharto's collapse. Today, the number of phone owned is more than the number of citizens in Indonesia, which is very telling about how um, connected we, are, or we all are. There has also been an increase in the precarious, which are defined as the unemployed, vulnerable and informal workers, uh, which is a group of people that are easily absorbed into the gig economy of the transport sector and has led to a spur in the gig economy in Indonesia. The rise of uh, apps such as Gojek and Grab has given rise to uh, discontent with a lot of legal controversies uh, happened because there's no oversight over these companies. Um, so this warrants the questions, um, are app-based driver micro-entrepreneurs or are they just precariat 4.0? Uh, it is clear that drivers have very little bargaining power as the tariff is decided by the company or the algorithm. Workers also lack contracts and therefore there is no legal obligation on the part of the company. So in a nutshell, the gig workers will have more bargaining power if uh, they are recognized or legitimized. Our speakers have outlined some of the way that gig workers can be helped. Uh, first of all, um, there should be more portable benefits. We need to resign, redesign our welfare arrangement so that protections is tied to the workers instead of the employers. Um, for example, uh, the Grab drivers or any companies, drivers from any ride-sharing companies should be able to contribute to their um, the healthcare insurance or the social insurance social security scheme. Um, in Malaysia, the government has provided a 50 million matching to contribute for their workers. Secondly, there should be more skills uh, training funds directed at workers. Um, the government may need to step in to direct the funds for gig workers 
to upskill and reskill as now they are more responsible for their own reskilling and upskilling. Uh, for example, Singapore Skills Future has directed uh, 200 sing dollars for their citizens for training programs. Uh, last but not least, the labor unions will also need to in include the platform workers. Uh, they, sh they should allow the workers to access to industrial courts and there should also be some standard setting at the international level when it comes to treatment of gig workers. So that was the first session. And in the last session, we have heard from uh, two of our speakers. One of them is uh, president of the Grab Drivers Association, uh, Mr. Ari, who has told us that um, during the lockdown, about 25% of gig workers in Malaysia have lost their job with their income reduced by at least 25%. So they needed to adapt. A lot of them, instead of uh, uh, taking passengers, they have changed to uh, deliveries. Um, because of a lack of control at the early stage, there were more supply to demand. Um, the association, Grab Divers Malaysia Association, was established to coordinate uh, among the drivers to make sure that the drivers have somewhere to turn to for help. And at the moment, they have about 500 members now. One of the policy uh, advisory that they have been very actively doing at the moment is to ensure that there will be safety for both drivers and passengers. And uh, one of the examples that we, he told us was how some drivers there was, there's a lot of emphasis on the safety for the passengers, but not enough for the drivers, and how some of the drivers actually have life-threatening situation as they were taking passengers. So a lot more will definitely needs to be done uh, in this regard. So the spec second uh, person that shared her experience with us was Dr. Robini Krishnan. Uh, for her, uh, her, her life as a doctor has definitely changed a lot since COVID-19. Uh, one of the greatest challenges according to her is that COVID-19 has caused a great barriers between the doctor and patient um, because, because uh, the need to wear a shield or a protection PPE has caused a loss in terms of a human touch because the patient can now no longer see the face of the doctors. Uh, and this is very difficult in terms of uh, building trust with the patients. The hospitals are also strained with resources and therefore those with non-COVID cases or not in the critical stage, stage has uh, been affected in terms of the, the access to healthcare. Um, attending to acute problems has also become very tedious uh, due to the SOP. Uh, however, the state has been very supportive in, throughout the crisis uh, there might be some issues in terms of the timeliness in the early stage, um, but things have gotten better. There's a psychological first aid prepared for all the pers medical personnel. Uh, Malaysia has also been working very hard to build good relations with uh, other countries that develop vaccines, and in particular with China, and has now been prioritized as a recipient for the vaccines. Uh, there's also a lot of work being done uh, in terms of primary education to the public, and, and this is mostly done through an app called MySajatra, where the user can access the risk status, their risk status, as well as other information such as hotspot, um, digital health, etc. In terms of uh, going forward, she thinks that we need to have greater awareness in terms of, uh, with regards to infectious disease, uh, we need to enhance our vigilance, uh, help healthcare workers to be more resilient, as well as instill passions among the younger generation uh, towards the healthcare sector. So that is the recap of, the, of yesterday's sessions. Sorry that it took a bit longer because it was quite a long session. And now I shall pass the time to our moderator of the day. Uh, and this is uh, Ms. Marie Chris Caberos. She is the coordinator of the Network for Social Democracy in Asia, uh, which is a regional group of political parties, formation and movements who share social democratic principles and perspective from 12 Asian countries. Uh, Makri started in politics as a youth activist 
before working as a development worker and as a policy advisor. And I say that personally, I'm also a beneficiary of some of the trainings that she has done in the past. Uh, Marquis also served as the youngest national president of Akbayan Citizens Action Party in Philippines from 2004 until now. So with that, I shall pass the time to you, Marquis. Thank you, Ivy. Um, thank you for inviting me to moderate this uh, session today. Um, thank you for giving us the recap of the session yesterday. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to all our guests and our panelists for today's session. Welcome to the Regional Conference of the Future of Work in the New Normal. This is under the program of uh, Economy of Tomorrow by the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung. And this program is also presented to us by the Research for Social Advancement um, based in Kuala Lumpur. I am based in Manila um, and uh, we, will, we are joined today by uh, distinguished panelists from different countries. But before we proceed, just um, for today's session, uh, we would like to encourage our um, listeners, our attendees to type in your questions or your interventions for today. Our panel discussion is the youth perspective on the future in the new normal. We will be discussing prospects of employment for young workers, needed support for young workers, demands, risks of the labor market, in the face of a uh, COVID-19 pandemic, and of course also an outlook on Agenda 2030. Um, we will also be discussing about workers' representation and how do we cope in this fast-changing um, um, world even throughout these challenges in, in the economy. As this is a regional conference on um, the future of work, um, it is very important to highlight, of course, perspective from young generation and, of course, insights from our experts today. I'm happy to welcome our distinguished panelists. First, uh, we will um, um, know from Dr. Lee Hok On, the Senior Fellow and Coordinator of Malaysia Studies Program of ICS Yusuf Ishak Institute from Singapore. And then we will be joined by Mr. Bima Yudhistira, the Associate of Center for Innovation and Digital Economy Institute for Development of Economy and Finance from Indonesia. And our commentator for today, joining us from um, Vietnam is Ms. Pam T. Tulan, who is the Deputy Director of the Institute for Workers and Trade Unions in Vietnam. Um, we will give our panelists um, their time for the presentation and uh, we will proceed with the discussion um, after Ms. Pam had presented her comments um, this afternoon. So welcome everyone. Uh, we'll give the floor first to you, Dr. Lee. Welcome. Thank you very much, um, uh, Chris. Thank you for the kind introduction. And I'm um, glad to join this uh, uh, panel. And I want to thank uh, REFSA and FES for this uh, kind invitation. And uh, what I will uh, do in the next uh, 20 minutes is uh, to share some data on uh, insights on employment and wages uh, in, in Malaysia. It's my home country and all my attention is, is really engrossed in, in Malaysia while I'm based in Singapore, uh, especially on youth. Um, I'll touch a little bit on, on COVID-19 uh, and then uh, uh, offer some reflections and also some questions because there are a lot of issues that I myself am also uh, thinking and so I look forward to discussion and, and I'm really at the point at the stage of, of um, still just probing with, uh, with questions about the possibilities. So this um, uh, takeaways, I, I hope, uh, you know, some things that you can uh, remember from today, especially would be about the youth uh, situation in, in Malaysia, youth here meaning 15 to 24 as, as per convention. 
they were more educated, especially in higher education and participating in the labor market and increasingly in self-employment. Unemployment remains uh, high and uh, wages low and social protection is inadequate. I think this is a recurring theme, but the, there will be some data to, to unpack that and illustrate that. Uh, number two, the labor market uh, insufficiently generates skilled jobs. So there's higher, more highly educated, but the share of skilled jobs uh, matching those qualifications, you know, is really quite uh, deficient. And of course, on the supply side, there's uh, issues about quality of education and training as well. Right? But there's sort of a complex of, of issues. Uh, what I will show some of the data of the labor force, you know, strikingly showing that uh, youth are mainly employed in service and sales in the production line is still a lot in, in those uh, uh, low, low skilled jobs, elementary jobs. Number three, wage growth. So we go from employment to wages. Now it is higher for the lowest paid uh, workers and uh, the low, the youngest are in also tend to be in that category. And I think this reflects the effects of uh, minimum wage. Where it is more sluggish is among uh, young adults, so more uh, workers in their uh, 20s. But there's an interesting contrast there. And then uh, more generally about, you know, the economic trends, technological change, Malaysia, as with all countries, is compelled to uh, to respond. Um, and uh, you know, my 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 thoughts are sort of really, I think, uh, more 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 general, and I, I'm in, and more in principle about what are uh, you know the uh, necessary uh, longer term objectives for employment growth, equitable opportunity, and social protection. And I touch a little bit on the lack of uh, workers' voice, and this is really more exploratory. Sorry, but I think it's it's you know really uh, very clear that there's a need to for representation to go beyond the established the traditional uh, industry or workplace unions. So uh, let me unpack a little bit more. Firstly, about the uh, employment and again in succession uh, participation and um, unemployment. So to illustrate uh, the attainment, the educational attainment. Uh, almost uh, a third of uh, 15 to 24 year olds uh, have tertiary le level qualifications that's much higher than the uh, older uh, workers. And you see in these uh, charts here showing the labor force uh, participation um, on, on the left. Um, and now you can see my cursor, I hope. Uh, they are uh, increasing in the share of slightly of uh, labor force uh, participation. That is those in the age that are working or looking uh, for work. But of course, it's still low and many are pursuing uh, higher education. On the right, uh, to illustrate the uh, unemployment rates, it is higher among youth as is everywhere. Now, this is not necessarily a very alarming thing because, because a lot of this is fresh graduates and people who are also you know, looking for jobs or in between jobs early in, 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 um, in their uh, labor force uh, participation. But the differential between the youth uh, unemployment and the rest is, is, is quite large. And it it's, it's, tends to be larger in Asia Pacific. So Malaysia follows that, that pattern, okay? So overall, although it's, you know, uh, overall Malaysia's unemployment really un, under 4%, uh, uh, 4%, you know, um, comparatively, it's not necessarily uh, very high. And even this youth unemployment, but the ratio from 4%, to 14, 15 percent um, is 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 quite a big uh, dif differential. Self-employment that's a that's a that's a big uh, theme these days, and I think at this conference, um, and it is uh, on the uh, rise, right? Um, that's reflected in the uh, red line. Right, and it is moving up, especially for young overall as well. But we should uh, not forget that the vast majority are still as working as as uh, employees. But uh, given uh, we do have an interest in in the self employment, um, uh, and there are many issues to talk about. And uh, just to bring up here again, I think to reiterate something that is you know coming up again and again, the issue of social uh, protection. And there's precariousness and uncertainty, you know, the borderline formality and informality, uh, disguise employment uh, or self-employment, you know, uh, being employed rather as contractors rather than employees and, and those set of uh, issues. Um, now, it is a necessary adaptation to technological change, as I said, but I think there are some other uh, issues, right, that really warrant our attention. And I think one concern of mine is, is that there's 
elements of it, depending on the sector, I suppose, um, and the types of uh, work and jobs that it can privilege the already advantaged. And one, um, uh, what one, one illustration of, of that is where the funds are coming from for self-employed. So this is taking the graduate tracer survey um, in, in Malaysia of uh, uh, 2018 and uh, asking them uh, what proportion uh, among those who are self-employed, where do they get their funds to get started? And almost 48% are from the family. Uh, a quarter uh, from themselves and uh, one fifth from uh, commercial uh, banks. So those with greater means ha have have a uh, greater uh, right uh, opportunity to get started in self-employment. So that's something of you know that has to be I think uh, a note of caution here and something policy will have to take into account. Uh, the <clears throat> the gig economy is really great to hear the summary from uh, yesterday, um, and uh, it it's. And I think we are in the moment where, yes, it is uh, dynamic and in, it, it's meeting certain interests, but taking the longer term view, I think some concerns to be raised are, you know, what kind of skills development, right, does it, does it, does it offer with, you know, jobs that are uh, not, not clearly offering like a, a career path and, and, and training and upskilling opportunities. So I just move on to uh, the jobs that, uh, that uh, Malaysian uh, youth, I'm sorry. I am the. I put my slides really near the margin, so I'm not reading the top very clearly. But where are they? Uh, where where are they uh, working? This is the occupational uh, profile. So this, uh, the lines are showing for the different uh, occupation groups, and in the squares here are the youth categories. What share of the total of these, you know, youth are? So for instance, 2011 about. Uh, almost 14% of, uh, of these 20 to 24 year olds are working in clerical jobs. And there's a clear decline uh, uh, in, in the share there. Now, as I was saying just now, this and this is uh, about the, the lack of uh, skill jobs among youth. So we can see here that the share of professionals, the share of youth who are working in professional jobs is, it has, has, is flat in Malaysia over the past uh, uh, decade. Right, and same as for uh, technicians. Further down uh, on the bottom bottom half, um, these are you know also skilled and going down to the elementary, uh, but in different categories we know as service and sales. Uh, craft workers are ones that do tend to have the uh, qualifications and particular right specific skills. So I do pay some attention to that because I think it's not given enough uh, attention, and I you know and and all and and as we pay attention to that, we see that that also is. Is flat, and there's still a high proportion that are in the green line, elementary, uh, production line work as well. So about you know 30 percent, and the one that's really most strike, uh, uh, most consistently rising is in service and sales uh, occupations. Now, among tertiary educated workers, and this is of all uh, ages, but I but I, I would. Uh, uh, say and I think we can confidently say that uh, these uh, the trends here are driven by the new entrants. So it is driven by uh, young uh, workers who are uh, entering the the workforce. And the share of professionals we can see has been uh, declining. You can follow the arrows here. Um, the share of technicians is static, and the main increases again are in um, in uh, service and sales, which is the one above. Uh, uh, craft uh, workers, as well as there's some increase even at the at the bottom end. Remember, these are all tertiary holders with diploma and degree uh, holders working in, in these jobs. What's notably low also is uh, craft workers. Now, this involves things like uh, you know, um, you know uh, mechanics and carpentry and plumbing and that kind of job. Uh, so. Other aspects, I think, uh, just to bring up here to follow up on the point raised just now that, that yes, the quality of education, language, technical, interpersonal skills, you know, these are uh, part of the complex of, of issues that I think are underlying the basically what the overarching uh, story here is that tertiary qualified high, high, with higher education degrees working in jobs that they're overqualified for. And also workplace uh, training that, uh, you know, there's a lot of evidence showing it's underprovided in Malaysia um, and, and not very uh, effective. 
Now, from uh, um, uh, participation, employment, now to uh, catch a few uh, snapshots of uh, wages with a focus on uh, youth. So which uh, levels right, remain uh, low? And here, um, for monthly wages in uh, last year, uh, 15 to 19 year olds, it's around 1,500. That means half of them earn less uh, than, than that. And uh, for 20 to 24 year olds, right, it, it's a bit uh, higher. As I mentioned just now, the, when, we, when we look at uh, wage uh, growth, though there is some interesting pattern that shows up in the data and that there's a significant difference between the late teens, 15 to 19 and 20 somethings. And actually there's a higher growth rate for the lowest paid jobs. This is uh, the elementary jobs and age groups. So what this, one, what this uh, table shows here is uh, by age uh, category. And it's the rate in the bar for 2010 to 2014 and then 2014 to 2019. This is coinciding with introduction of minimum wage in 2014 when it took effect. Um, and again, for uh, you know, disproportionately affecting the lowest paid and also the youngest uh, workers. So it is, I think, reflecting um, in the, 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 those effects of intervention at, 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 at the wage uh, floor. But um, it's also uh, striking that uh, the slow wage growth for uh, younger adults. Okay, so if you compare moving up and the dots here is for the whole decade, that's the average wage there. Uh, there uh, from the data set that I mentioned just now, the graduate uh, tracer, uh, we can get some interesting insight into self-employed graduates. So this is again the asking at, at the graduation ceremonies around that time uh, and it gets a large sample, you know, those who are self-employed, what's some ways that we, some kind of profiling that, that, that emerges. Um, here we're looking at the earnings and um, as expected, right, the higher level uh, of education, master's, PhD, and bachelor's and certificates, um, that corresponds with uh, wage uh, earnings uh, levels. There's also differences between private and uh, public uh, institutions, if you compare uh, these two. So, the yeah, that, this means that those earning less than 2,000, more than 85 or 80 percent earn less than uh, 2,000. Okay, I think another one that that uh, that to me was quite striking was when it's broken down by by jobs, okay. and and uh, this follows on the my interest in those uh, craft craft workers, in that um, the the earnings at at the start at least among the graduates who have just started the business is is higher, is highest among the major main uh, categories. So you have about 85% earning uh, more than uh, uh, up to 3,000. So 3,000 per month and less. And, and, and that compares with these other uh, categories. Now, the one that's given a lot of attention, uh, e-business, and there are good reasons for that, especially in pandemic, but you know, it, it doesn't escape from the fact that it's not re um, that the earnings for graduates um, self-employed graduates for e-business is less than uh, for those doing construction, electrical, plumbing, contractors, and so on. Right. Now, let me touch a bit on uh, COVID-19. Uh, um, Malaysia um, it was uh, was hit and and uh, from, from March, there were uh, uh, movement control order, a lockdown. Um, and so some of that effects you could see rippling through with the rising unemployment from February into uh, May. Uh, there's been an inflection point and it stabilized a little bit, but overall there's still a uh, you know, very, very significant increase in uh, unemployment. And um, other uh, surveys uh, would have uh, been able to uh, break down where they are and self-employed is expected and services have been the worst hit. Um, month to month, there's not uh, data enough sample to talk to um, to speak of to break down into your youth or break down by, by age but quarterly yes it's also showing the quarterly data is showing the rise in youth unemployment as well and their rate you know they are they're much worse affected now there are prevailing um, un uncertainties and here I <clears throat> also wanted to bring up a sector that should not really this should not be omitted too much with all the attention on uh, services which is the uh, manufacturing and just came out in the data that uh, with um, 
although 60,000 60, jobs were added in July, almost the same amount were lost in uh, the month of uh, August. So it's really a situation of flux, you know, but the, I think uh, the Malaysia is not one to, to get complacent, although it's, it, there's, there's certainly been uh, this, uh, some momentum over a few months in, in the direction of uh, recovery. And um, COVID-19 responses have uh, mainly focused on uh, job uh, retention. And that is, of, uh, you know, justifiable and, and fully uh, warranted and, and necessary for those who have jobs to remain uh, employed. But as moving forward, there will be increasing need to address the issue of job uh, creation. So I think just one point that needed to be raised in the context of COVID-19 and uh, moving forward. The wage subsidy and other support um, uh, like loan moratoriums, I think have uh, played a role in mitigating uh, the fallout. Um, but throughout this, you know, Malaysia has, I think, really missed an opportunity it's an opportunity for greater uh, to reset, as we're talking about reset, right? Uh, tripartite engagements. Maybe the first few months, uh, you know, where if everything was very fluid, it, would be, it was more challenging to sit down the tripartite table and really thrash things out. But after these uh, six, seven months, um, it's it's that's not really an excuse anymore uh, that you know, the urgency uh, issue where I think a lot of structural issues and the workers' representation, uh, lack of it, I think is, is a major issue for, uh, for, for, for Malaysia. And so uh, I'm moving to a conclusion now with some thoughts um, on uh, this topic on, on youth, on, on the a new economy. And I start with a general one, which, and I think this is in the spirit of what this conference is also trying to achieve to you know, really uh, uh, explore, right? Um, to ask questions, to, to, to imagine. Um, and I think that is needed, a new mindset, a new uh, ethos on, on work. I think this is a moment that that in Malaysia, regionally, globally, you know, where I think it is really opportune to be asking and probing uh, the more fundamental questions about jobs, about productivity, dignity, equality, you know, fairness, living wage, uh, decent work. I'm really uh, heartened that the work of you know, um, uh, refs are in, you know, trying to piece together, right? Uh, in a very comprehensive and holistic uh, way. And I think that's really necessary. Um, Broad-based and quality jobs and self-employment uh, programs. Um, Malaysia needs to move out of a low wage, low skill labor intensive uh, uh, modes. It's sort of this ongoing uh, and uh, decades long challenge that we're still not really, I think, seeing that uh, breakthrough. Uh, following up on, on um, the some of the data that I presented, and I think the uh, concern about overemphasis perhaps on the e-commerce, craft workers and the manufacturing sector, I think should not be uh, omitted. And in the gig economy, yeah, there's a need for to, to uh, look further as well about the quantity, quality as um, a site that is generating jobs, but what about the longer term and, and the skills uh, development and security and so on. Um, touching on wages, living wages, sustaining wage growth, uh, decent uh, work. So we see that the lowest earners are supported by minimum wage. I think that is uh, noble, it's necessary, it must continue. Um, but there are gaps here and there, and I think you know one that stands out is among, in the middle, semi-skilled workers, where they have not protected by the, the wage flow, minimum wage type of interventions, uh, maybe not even qualifying for a lot of social assistance, but also not uh, also weak bargaining power and low earnings growth. And uh, so to, uh, to, to push towards right, um, an agenda that is driven by decent work and pursuing the high road of high productivity, high wage, you know, work-life balance. Again, these are, these are just very general, general ideas, but I think we need to start with, with asserting those principles. And then um, further imperatives um, about uh, social uh, protection. Right? I think that needs to be uh, really consolidated. It needs to be 
deeper embedded and 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 more uh, uh, broader in in in, in its scope not for all times in under all situations but as also for you know future pandemic and financial uh, crises and the last one that i that i uh, bring up is is uh, there's a personal side to this as well and then for 15 out of the 20 years of 15 out of my 20 working years i have been a union member in university and as a graduate uh, student so it 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 resonates in my heart as well and uh, I, it's, I bring it up not really because i have a very concrete idea but having seen that there is this huge gap and in malaysia the voice is just really uh, absent i mean i think the the, the the, the grab association right is is one is one exception but there too it's not where does it stand it's not a union um you know it's 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 authority and legal uh, status um i i just raised this as just a point to to you know to ponder reimagining a tripartite system um i'm there was a work that uh, by guy standing um who is big in this field and also in basic income grant where he speaks of shifting from industrial based to occupational based that's really a very general uh, idea but I, I i i think there is a lot to that and there's something that really worth uh, pursuing so meaning not from industry but to something like that are related to occupations and, and so maybe revival of gills or something like that i mean that's about as far as i could come up with at this point because i really want to hear more and, and learn more and i think with that i conclude thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Lee, for your presentation. Thank you for um, providing us your, your insight on the future of work by uh, presenting to us the wage floor and employment landscape in Malaysia, um, taking into account where young people are in at the moment. You've also uh, given us your reflections on the road to recovery, which is basically uh, uh, warrants us to reimagine the the ethos of work and uh, what really has to be generated from now on in terms of employment um, i like that you pointed out that it should be based on human dignity and decent work and workers representation and i think the questions that you pose and the elements of a proposal or proposals um, um, are good uh, take off points for for the discussion this afternoon we'll now go we'll now go to um indonesia um mr bima yudistira um welcome you have the floor thank you thank you for refsa and fes for arranging this uh, afternoon discussion yeah in indonesia and malaysia afternoon discussion yeah and then thank you for uh, dr lee i think uh, many, many interesting point. I just want to add up, uh, if Dr. Lee in Malaysia perspective, uh, I'm, I want to add up the Indonesian uh, perspective. So let me share my presentation first. Okay, I just move on. The first one is, uh, yes, we have the pandemic uh, situation everywhere in the world. Indonesia also hit the most uh, even though the confirmed case in Indonesia is slightly later on uh, in March, yeah, uh, in China maybe in uh, late of December and some of the countries in February, but the first confirmed case in March and therefore uh, we see the people mobility moving to the retail and grocery stores is decline or below the baseline uh, and then it's continue even we have a long holiday so in indonesia if you want to see the economic activities just look in the seasonal uh, features in the long holiday we have Eid mubarak uh, at the time in the end of the may until uh, earlier june and we can see at the end of uh, new year's eve and christmas in december so there is a two peak of economic activity in Indonesia, Christmas and Eid Mubarak uh, long holiday for Muslim. So at the beginning of the confirmed case, 90% uh, of the small medium enterprise need government support. And this is a very difficult moment because we never seen this crisis before. In 1998, financial crisis in uh, Asian countries, 
small medium enterprise can be a motor of the economic recovery. In 2008, same, we have uh, bailed out some of the bank in Indonesia. However, small medium enterprise still survive. And the people who let off from the factory or from the formal sector can easily join the small medium enterprise at the time. But this time is different. To 2020, when the pandemic hits, even small medium enterprise, where it's also the, the youth uh, population or worker, uh, many in a small medium enterprise, they also need the government support. So this time is different. And the mobility, even when the office is begun to open, uh, we call it in Indonesia, new normal or new adaptation, uh, still the mobility of the people, especially the middle and upper class of the consumer, still low to visit the retail and grocery store. So it is, uh, I think, prolonged uh, crisis. Some of the experts uh, suggest that this crisis may be end in 2022. So it will be continue until two years from now. So we have a very difficult situation. And uh, before uh, the pandemic hit, let's look at the data from the World Bank. Uh, this statistics said that 15.8% of the Indonesia youth, 15 to 24 uh, years old uh, ages, is uh, quite higher compared even with the Malaysia, with the China, even with the Timor Leste and India. So we just worried that we just below slightly some of the country, which is, uh, we can say the failure state there. Yeah? Uh, we have Iraq and also uh, Egypt. Uh, Saudi Arabia is still okay, but the youth uh, unemployment is still high also. So we just worried we have right now some situation where the youth unemployment is uh, currently high. And then we have a political uh, situation in Indonesia. Maybe you heard about the protests going on about the omnibus law. So this is the combination of the dangerous uh, figures. And then how about the youth and women at the same time? they suffered the double hit uh, scenario. Because if we combining the female unemployment, youth uh, higher rather than the average of uh, the total or average of the youth unemployment in Indonesia. So 16.1%. And this is the condition just before uh, COVID-19. 26.3% uh, of the worker in Indonesia worker in the longer hour. So it is uh, interesting to see that Indonesia is number three, uh, which we have a hard uh, worker or hard labor. So in Indonesia situation, because of the wages is, uh, yeah, wages is increased every year, but if we com compare with the purchasing power, for instance, the Indonesia wages for the youth and labor in average is still uh, lower compared with the other countries. So. Uh, when you work in the factory, at least uh, until 5 p.m., you need to work uh, in informal sectors. So it is common in Indonesia, the, the worker in the formal sectors, also the worker in the informal sectors, because they need to work as a Gojek, for instance, because the wages is not sufficient uh, to fulfill their uh, basic needs. So this is the condition that uh, in the future, uh, the government plan to bring more labor intensive. So uh, if Dr. Lee uh, from Malaysia perspective said that the Malaysia need to change from the labor intensive uh, sectors to more technological advance, for instance. But in Indonesia, because of this situation, the government uh, still postponed to move to high tech sector in average. They, they want to bring back the labor intensive. Uh, so we, we're going to back to 1980s uh, scenarios during the du Suharto, many outsource uh, company from Adidas, Nike, uh, Puma, Reebok, the international brand have their uh, outsource uh, factory in Indonesia. So this is a quite interesting situation. And how about the phenomena of the digital economy and impact uh, both yeah, youth and women, because this is interesting. So in informal sectors, many women also join uh, as a ride hailing apps driver. And the problem is, uh, if they have any insurance cover for accident, uh, the answer is, it depends. Some of the red hailing apps, because we have like uh, more than uh, four red hailing apps company, 
Grab and Gojek is uh, yeah one of the biggest, but we have another uh, smaller uh, ride hailing apps. So when the driver got an uh, accident, and then it uh, depends if they have a social uh, security from the government, uh, the health costs will be covered. But if not, there is no uh, obligation or there is no responsibility from the ride hailing apps to provide such a private insurance, for instance. Is that a fair wage? We don't think so. Even uh, this is the current debate in Indonesia, is the ride hailing apps uh, is include as a worker because uh, the ride hailing apps company keeps saying this is the sharing economy. This is not the formal, even not informal. Sharing economy is totally different. It's not formal, it's not informal. So they don't protect uh, with the current uh, law uh, under uh, worker uh, right law 2003. And then the work duration. Uh, some of the driver, uh, women also, they work uh, perhaps more than 10 to 12 hours per day. And there is no pension, there is no job certainty. So if you're wearing the costume of the Gojek or Grab, uh, it is a consequence. You cannot be the high level of the worker. You cannot be a permanent worker. So there is no job uh, certainty if you're working in the red hailing apps. And also we have a family issue. Uh, what kind of the family issue? Because this woman and this youth, uh, some of them already married, for instance, uh, they have a uh, issue of the work-life balance because they need to work 10 to uh, 12 hours per day. They have children in the home and the husband is also work in the factory or in the other sector. So there will be like a conflicting because of the work-life balance is uh, damaging because of this condition of red hailing apps. Um, this is opportunity and also challenge for Indonesia youth because we're facing the demographic uh, bonus where the productive uh, class uh, bought also good in cons cons some uh, goods and then they produce goods also. Uh, we, we, we begin to have a demographic bonus and it will be continue at the peak is 2030. So this is also creating a problem where many uh, working age uh, generation is increased, but the uh, digital uh, booming is not helping them. Uh, not all of the youth is helped by the digital booming because this uh, digital booming is only uh, prefer for the undergraduate uh, bachelor degree from the university, have a good degree in the IT, for instance. But the other youth, which is uh, graduate from vocational school, for instance, is one of the highest unemployment rate in Indonesia. So it's not an equal opportunity for all youth in Indonesia, but we have a demographic bonus. Okay. And uh, this also opportunity, but also problem, because uh, Indonesia is considered as the fifth top uh, number of a startup in the world. Uh, 2012 to three, uh, 2,203 number of the startup. But the problem is uh, we have skill mismatch where the student graduate from vocational school and university degree even cannot compete with the foreign, in, uh, foreign uh, worker uh, coming to the digital sectors. So this is also problematic when the government see this problem. Uh, they said that it took longer for the student to study about the big data, about the artificial intelligence. So the shortcut is the government right now with the omnibus law, they will open uh, the door for the foreign worker uh, and then work in the startup uh, company. So this is also problematic. In the, Indonesia is uh, relatively late to plan for the revolution uh, industrial revolution 4.0 compared with the other country so we just begin to have a planning in early 2018 so it's still scratch that's why I tell you that uh, yes there is a digital booming in Indonesia uh, 175 million people using the internet actively but the problem is uh, from the government preparation they prepare it uh, very very late compared with the other country uh, are we ready yet if we look at the digital competitiveness ranking from the IMD, we will see that uh, business agility, you can see in the bottom of the right, 
uh, figures, the business agility is quite uh, higher rank. It's rank 21 in the world. It means that even though we have lack of infrastructure and the geographical location of the Indonesia is, we have 17,000 island, but there is a business agility, which means the business, uh, the youth, which is uh, found the startup, for instance, they're ready in the very, very hard situation. But the problem is business agility is not matched with the IT integration. This is more uh, in the infrastructure side and also not matched with the talent because our rank in the talent is very, very low compared with the other country. And for the youth not in education, employment or training, this is uh, quite high, 21.4%. Again, uh, quite high compared with the peer country in ASEAN. So education training is also lack in Indonesia. That's why the government want to shortcut to open uh, opportunity for foreign worker instead of uh, beginning to have a good academic, for instance, and good university uh, training. So this is also uh, creating another problem because we see that if we're talking about the digital booming, even in the pandemic, some people is beginning to move to transfer their consumption uh, based to the digital e-commerce, for instance, but the talent in Indonesia is uh, uh, most problematic uh, things about the, the future of the world. And also, uh, who's benefit with this uh, future of work? This is the map of uh, Indonesia city, uh, Jakarta. Jakarta is uh, in the top, uh, in the right uh, hand position. Yeah? So Jakarta is uh, good in the internet connectivity, but also higher in the Gini ratio or in the inequality rates. It means that who benefit from the digital booming is uh, the rich people or the rich youth which have uh, equal which has a good opportunity to study in the higher education uh, who have opportunity for instance to learn english even i think that's important things and then good opportunity for instance to to study about the uh, it skills yeah so this is my my last uh, slide that uh, i want to suggest that uh, in the country for instance like indonesia what we need is the holistic national talent plan so uh, how come we, we we discuss about the future of work when 30 percent of the baby in indonesia is stunting you know there's the problem of the basic <laughs> how to compete with the international uh, worker or the foreign worker if we still suffering the lack of uh, nutrition for our baby and then the basic education we have 20 percent of the government budget uh, going to the education but this also debate in indonesia because vietnam also have 20 percent if i'm not mistaken yeah 20 percent of the government budget going to education but the quality of the pizza uh, mathematics uh, science and reading in Indonesia is far below the Vietnam peers. So this also we need to, to look out about the, the corruption in the education, about the effectiveness. And then we can have a, a dual plan for the one that have high skill and high education, the government needs to support the innovation and research and development budget. But for the semi-skill, which is have not opportunity to go to the higher education like university degree, uh, maybe link and match with industry is more important. So in Indonesia, the problem is 70% of the curriculum in the vocational school is uh, about uh, reading the textbook or memorizing the textbook. Only 30% of the curriculum is practical teaching. But this is a uh, vocational school. It should be like 70% of them is uh, you know practical and talking with the industrial expert. Uh, not reading the book or the manual book only. This is also a problem. So for high skill and high, high education, uh, digital ecosystem, giving the good uh, internet connect connection, giving scholarship, state-owned enterprise driven, so state-owned enterprise can absorb youth uh, employment. And the one that low competition territory, this is uh, not have opportunity to achieve even uh, vocational school, 
and also don't have uh, opportunity to achieve higher education, we also need to take care of them. That's why the government have a small medium enterprise, or we call it UMKM, go digital. So many of the youth, uh, which is don't have uh, equal opportunity to achieve higher education, they can make uh, a team together to build small medium enterprise and sell the product in the e-commerce platform, for instance. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I give back to moderator. Thank you, Mr. Bima, for your presentation. I, I like it that you have a, a novel idea on how to move forward with your talent plan for, for Indonesia. But prior to that, um, I'd also like to appreciate that um, the effects of the pandemic in the employment landscape of Indonesia, um, I think uh, puts us now in a worrying situation because you said that uh, for a young woman in Indonesia now, it is a, uh, we are in a very uh, precarious uh, and worrying situation in terms of um, getting employed. And uh, I think that ties to how you also answer it with your proposed talent plan on how to address inadequacies and social problems that are there in, uh, in the Indonesian um, society. Um, we, will, we will move on to uh, our commentator. Thank you again, Mr. Bima. Um, to our participants listening, you can type in your questions for Dr. Lee and Mr. Bima, and then we will uh, proceed with the discussion. But we will uh, hear first from our expert from Vietnam, her comments and reflections on the presentation. Ms. Pam Thie uh, Tulan, you have the floor. You have the floor. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Marcus. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, FES and Repsa for my chance to participate in this conference. Uh, and I thank the two speakers, uh, Dr. Lee and Mr. Burma, for uh, your insightful presentations on the situation in Malaysia and Indonesia, um, which uh, reflects the characteristics of higher vulnerability for youth. The two presentations have a touch on the predominant matters on youth. I think these matters are not only in Malaysia and Indonesia, but also in many other countries in the world, uh, including Vietnam. Uh, let's talk about in the in in the presentations, I share the point that your youth are more likely in self-employment, especially with the platform and gig economy now growing. Can, can you uh, move the next slide? Especially, um, in, uh, so youth are more likely in self-employment, especially with the platform and gig economy now growing. Many youth are now working for Uber or Grab or other transport platforms as wood delivery workers in return and grocery, as quick workers to provide small service to company like uh, such as a small survey data collection or producing an online advertisement rather than traditional model of companies. In Vietnam, during the high time of COVID-19, while others can stay at home to keep them from virus infection, many youth have to keep dangerous, uh, have to accept dangerous working conditions to deliver goods and foods to families. Uh, so employment means one way to standard setting by the employer or the platform running companies. They are not covered by law regarding their employment relationship with the company and therefore not guaranteed with a minimum wage, occupational safety and health, compulsory social insurance coverage uh, with a contribution partly from the company. And uh, another point is touched in the presentation is that uh, youth are among the lowest wage group. And uh, and for your information, minimum wage in Vietnam is uh, not a living wage, but a level to escape poverty line. Even though many youth are refused a minimum wage as they are self-employed or they are uh, 
um, they have to accept employment at the cost of decent wage. Uh, youth are also more likely in other non-standard employments. It can be explained that uh, they are new in the labor market, a transition from school to work. They uh, lack job experience. It's very common in Vietnam and in other countries as well that youth are more employed by fixed term contracts. And those with fixed term contracts are the first to leave. So far, Vietnam has uh, 31.8 million people in Asia 15 years old and over affected by COVID-19, including those who lost jobs, have working hours reduced or working days reduced, uh, resulting in reduced income or lost income uh, with a high rate falling on young people, especially those working in the export lab labor intensive sectors. Youth are also commonly seen working in part-time or on-call job uh, or work as subcontracted labor or through temporary agency. Many youth work in apprenticeships or internships. These are all um, uh, type of employment with uh, no job security. Um, like self-employment, these types of non-standard work do not guarantee minimum working hours. Uh, nor minimum wages, nor social insurance and unemployment benefits. Um, so COVID, uh, during COVID-19, they are not only the ones who have to leave the job first, but in many cases, they don't get their unemployment benefits after losing jobs. What is more to talk is that uh, once you are stick to non-standard employment, uh, it's more likely to transition between non-standard employment and unemployment and more difficult to transition to better jobs. And for migrant workers, it's even more difficult. And uh, the presentations also confirm the fact that unemployment is high among the youth. And this is the situation in many countries. In Vietnam, youth unemployment is always higher than normal unemployment rate. 6.5% uh, versus 2.15% uh, in the quarter four of last year, that is before COVID-19, and 6.98% versus 2.73% uh, in the second quarter of uh, 2020. Uh, youth is often with higher education, but what is a strength in Vietnam is that uh, unemployment is almost the highest among the university graduate uh, group uh, compared with other groups of low education in Vietnam. So uh, uh, the second highest unemployment group among the six group classification according to the population uh, general survey in 2019. Uh, even many university graduate uh, youth have to work as a garment workers, uh, as low skilled workers. This is because the economy of Vietnam is more labor intensive than knowledge intensive. And uh, another point about skills for work 4.0, that is the work in the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, I thank uh, Burma for complimenting Vietnam. But uh, in fact, skills for work 4.0 is uh, still a great color uh, in Vietnam because the uh, knowledge of skills needed for work 4.0 among the youth in Vietnam is unclear. Uh, as well as the uh, education system is not qualified enough to provide training on skills for work 4.0. It is also challenging as uh, skill training would be a mismatch if the economy does not change accordingly. I want to touch the matter of gender dimension and the youth. In Vietnam, all labor-intensive sectors like textile, garment, footwear, electronics production are predominant with young workers aged 25 and 35 years old. These sectors are dependent on export to EU and US, and they will continue to be affected if the EU and US don't control the virus, and therefore youth will be the most affected. Although also a lot of uh, youth women are affected because these labor-intensive labor sectors are more than 70% female predominant. 
many female youth lost their job in these sectors and moved to informal sector. And my two speakers also talk about heritage issue of lack of uh, rep representations and voice. Uh, they do not have collective bargaining and it's more challenging in the gig economy. Youth are less organized because they are more likely to work in non-standard employment, so it's difficult to organize them the way we organize workers in employed workplaces, sectors or industries. In Vietnam, there have been spontaneous collective actions by Grab drivers to oppose the increase in discount rate in January 2018. And the same happened with other Vietnamese uh, driving apps, uh, such as B Bike or B Car in uh, November 2019. By the act that uh, drivers refused to pick up passengers. These uh, strikes have uh, forced the companies into dialogue with the drivers, which results in the company's withdrawal of their discount increase. And this try suggest new way for organizing in the platform economy using internet connection, but it's uh, not easy at all. Uh, um, uh, due to uh, everything in the internet can be tracked and workers are fearful of uh, job loss uh, and recorded the profile. So in conclusion, uh, youth in the future, um, youth uh, is the future of the economy and they need more attention in the policy making to increase their employability in a circuit job in the new normal. So here's uh, some of my recommendations. First, uh, trade unions need to uh, discuss on organizing youth and how to organize them in the platform and gig economy and how trade unions work in the platform and gig economy. And tomorrow we will have a session on, uh, on this. Uh, second, awareness raising and capacity building programs for the youth should be developed for them to voice their rights to organize and engage in collective bargaining. Third, non-standard employment need to be regulated under employment law and labor law, and there should be an international approach towards an outcome that the, the governments to make a commitment on this. Fourth, the same is for achieving an international commitment by governments on setting minimum wage as a living wage. Uh, fifth, SEU employment is high in many countries, so countries need to develop a national strategy to tackle youth unemployment. And uh, sixth, uh, formalization of the informal economy must be a priority agenda in the 21st century, and initiatives for uh, on formalization should be promoted. Uh, seventh, uh, social protection uh, need to be designed based on workers, uh, which is suitable for all workers in the gig economy. And uh, that is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you, Ms. Pam, for sharing with us your reflections on um, the presentation and also giving us a glimpse of what's happening in um, Vietnam in terms of um, uh, employment. Um, indeed, I agree with you that um, what has been presented about uh, Malaysia and Indonesia are not only uh, confined to, to, to them as national issues, but also uh, reflects global and um, regional uh, challenges, which this conference I know is uh, trying to, to uh, answer in terms of um, making us focus on how to move forward given the challenges that were um, enumerated. Um, you've also mentioned your recommendations um, based on the analysis of the vulnerabilities of the youth sector in terms of uh, jobs and um, precarity, and um, it involves uh, national regulation, strategy, and uh, fulfilling international commitments that our government have actually signed on and uh, have uh, have been there for a long time, but um, seems now that it's even more um, challenging given the pandemic. But 
moving forward, there's a sense that um, there are things we need to review that were already there, but we also need to rethink of um, ways to um, be able to move ahead of, of, of these challenges and answering the, the questions that were posed um, to us. So thank you, Ms. Pam. Um, you, you can, of course, join us in the discussion. I'd like to welcome back our, our panelists um, for, for today's session. And we would be uh, entertaining the questions from, from the attendees. Um, again, you can type in your questions in the Q&A box or in the chat box um, for, our, for our panelists. I see here that there are already um, um, two questions from um, E. Lin Sin. Um, this is uh, for, for our panelists. So Dr. Lee and uh, Mr. Bima, um, you can, you can um, uh, answer these questions um, that are here in the chat box. The, the attendee asked how relevant is tertiary education given the lack of high skilled professional jobs in Malaysia? Should universities diversify and offer more job-based programs? perhaps in the form of apprenticeships, where students are trained in more job-ready skills, guaranteed jobs upon graduation, and experience clearer career progression routes. Another question is, a lot of emphasis has been given to a shift towards digital economy and the accumulation of technical skills to keep up with the changing conditions in employment. What role can the social sciences play in this uh, process? So, um, Dr. Lee, Mr. Bima. Uh, let me get started. Yeah, thank you. Um, yes, it's in for the question. Uh, it's very, very pertinent. It's a huge uh, issue uh, covering a lot of um, interrelated uh, aspects. Uh, how relevant is tertiary education given the lack of high skill professional jobs? Well, I, I mean, I think starting, I start out by asking, you know, who, who are the people in involved in tertiary education? If it's the broader question of is it still relevant? Um, <clears throat> there's no uh, escaping, you know, our, our the, the biology, right, of we have, uh, you know, the age at which people can complete secondary and uh, enter into tertiary. And I think it's still at that age of maybe 18 to, to 20, uh, where <clears throat> um, immersion in, in education, I think is, is still appropriate for the vast majority, still young and, uh, and, and, and uh, immature and finding their, their way in the world. So that's one thing that I think before uh, to, to address whether or not it, it's still, uh, still, still relevant from, from the perspective of uh, just, you know, growing up and progressing in life and the particular uh, age group. And we see that as well, right, in the data that 15 to 19, the participation in, in labor is still quite, quite, quite low. I think people value that. Um, but then, yeah, the question though, where, what kind of uh, um, uh, education? And I think, um, I mean, I think one angle that, that uh, to, uh, to, to answer this, this question is, is, you know, because you're talking about the pr progression, I think people do look at what the uh, prospects would be for choosing different uh, education uh, paths, some that are more, um, you know, <clears throat> maybe more skill and, and, and technically oriented. And so I, I think uh, in the backdrop of this, I think one issue that, that countries like Malaysia will need to address is, yeah, you know, how, how well is it paying? And, you know, it's a very uh, basic, right? The, 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 it, it's a material issue, but it's still essential to make those, you know, the craft jobs that I was trying to, you know, that, 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 uh, uh, that I had uh, focused on now and again in, in, the, in, in, in the presentation. I think that's a very important element of it. And I think to, I, basically I'm on, you know, on, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on board with, with I think the, the line, the, 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 the question, I guess, is, is sort of leading, leading in that direction that this needs to happen a bit more. That are you know skills uh, apprenticeships that are more um, 
jobs that are more like real world uh, ready and applicable so that there's a smoother uh, tra transition. Um, but with the further uh, need in the labor market to make sure that right that they will be you know received into jobs and that they can pursue uh, self-employment in, in a way that that is more uh, re uh, rewarding um, but I also I think we need to ask what is the role if we specific you know and and I think this is more in the context of well I mean universities and colleges is uh, well but it arises more in the case of universities I think that's maybe an unfortunate bias about is it just about training you for you know to be a, equipping you for a job is it just about skills and then you know and 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 already kind of uh paving the way that you have already an internship and then you straight away graduate into a job or is there more to it to be a citizen you know just to to know about the world to know about the history of your country the, the issues that the country is dealing with its policies its gender issues its uh history uh, uh, uh ethnic relations so i think again this those are formative years that i think education is also essential not just in universities i think but also in the other fields where yeah they're 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 being um uh, groomed um, being challenged to, you know, to be better people and, uh, and, and, and citizens. Um, I have a certain bias, right, coming formally working in the university in the social sciences. Um, you know, but it is informed by seeing the impact that, that education uh, can have in, in those, those areas. I think the second question is, um, is, is also interrelated. Maybe you can also tackle that because I am also speaking from that experience in the social uh, sciences. And I think one aspect of this is that, you know, a continuous debate, and I don't think it will ever be resolved between generalist and specialist, right? And of course, I don't think, um, I mean, only someone who is like really, really, you know, uh, dogmatic and super opinionated will say either or. I think it's sort of elements of, of both. But I think this quite, that, that issue does, um, does come up here because I think social science does uh, can, can, can benefit a lot in terms of a generalist, uh, the, the generalist aspect uh, training in terms of um, you know, knowledge of society so the content itself, but also things like writing, uh, thinking uh, skills, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the fields like philosophy um, and, and history, not necessarily specializing, majoring in those fields, uh, but it's just part of, you know, the, the social sciences, what it can contribute, I think, more, uh, more, more generally. And I think it's not too, um, it's not just about, uh, and it's not to, we shouldn't say that it's all, uh, I shouldn't, you know, think too much along the lines that these are only soft and impractical. Because I think there are very practical applications. It's just that maybe in a more uh, general and more, you know, transferable uh, way compared to the more s professional trained, you know, skill uh, specific, you know, even things like innovation, creativity. Um, I, I, the, one, the, the one thing I think is really, really lacking, I speak to the Malaysian universities, is writing. They don't teach about writing, which I think is really the instrument, um, you know, the medium that can really, really, uh, you know, uh, deepen and, and uh, thinking abilities that, that, can, that can, you know, uh, to refine your thoughts and articulate. So we focus on the skill of like making a presentation, but not enough on sitting back and really processing the thoughts. And I think that is actually both very general, but also very, uh, you know, uh, practical. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I'll, I'll return uh, to you with another question um, later, but I'll have uh, Mr. Bima or, or even Ms. Pam, if you can weigh in on, yeah. on the question. Okay, thank you. So in the case of some countries, including Indonesia, of course, the cost of uh, doing business is higher because what? Because the company need to, you know, need to have a cost of education or training again for the company coming from academia, coming from a university, coming from professional school. So can you imagine even though they have a 
internship before, but the company still uh, get a lot of a problem because the internship is not enough. Uh, so what's the solution? The solution is the triple helix between the company, between the university, and then the government. It should be included in the beginning. That's why uh, I thought earlier that uh, we need to think about uh, the curriculum when uh, first in the vocational school or in the university. So the industry can be involved directly to set up the curriculum together yeah, with the government and then with the university. What kind of the skill set that the industry needs in, in, in this uh, future? And then uh, how to solve this kind of uh, skill mismatch? So in the very, very beginning, that's that's uh, that's uh, so solving the problem of uh, higher uh, training uh, costs yeah, uh, for the fresh graduate, and then uh, the second one, uh, the question about the role of uh, social science. I think uh, how if uh, everyone uh, study about the coding, everyone study about the big data, uh, good in the IT sector, but lack of literacy. That also uh, one of the problem in uh, Indonesia right now. The literacy uh, among youth in Indonesia is quite uh, low. Uh, so people and also the parents uh, begin to, you know, uh, forcing the children like the Singaporean. So uh, the Singapore is uh, famous in Indonesia because uh, I don't know in the in the elementary school or something they already learn about the coding. Yeah, about the coding, about the data analysis. And then many parents in Indonesia uh, push the children to study the coding, but uh, not pushing them to read a social science book or the other, uh, even the literature, any literature books. So there's also creating a, another problem. You, you can do the coding, you can uh, do the big data with uh, a sophisticated machine or program, but the problem is you cannot interpret uh, that uh, data. That's, yeah, I agree with Dr. Lee totally that uh, the social science is uh, involved in important things to the future of works, yeah, or the future of digitalization. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bima. Um, Ms. Pam, would you like to, to weigh in on, on this? Uh, yes, uh, I also would like to share a bit about uh, our situations that um, uh, regarding the development of the digital economy uh, in Vietnam, I think it's uh, still a long way to go uh, because uh, uh, similar to Indo Indonesia, uh, Vietnam is still a very uh, labor intensive and uh, the uh, uh, workforce uh, are low skilled and uh, the rate of the workforce uh, goes through the uh, uh, training is very low, uh, around more than 20% uh, of, uh, uh, of the total labor force uh, have a training. Uh, and um, also the training education system is also uh, not prepared for training uh, the workforce for the digital uh, economy. Uh, although we have a good internet, internet connection, we have uh, um, uh, people, a lot of people have uh, smartphones, but uh, they use a uh, uh, smartphone uh, for uh, social interactions, uh, uh, for uh, e-commerce, uh, more than for online education. And also the, um, the education system is more knowledge-based uh, uh, training and education rather than uh, problem-solving based, uh, rather than uh, soft skill uh, training based. And I think uh, problem solving skills or uh, soft skills are very important in the digital economy uh, as we need to work, uh, need to have a teamwork uh, to uh, solve the problem, uh, especially when the artificial intelligence, intelligence can uh, do many work. Uh, so uh, how to solve the problem is very important, but um, that is not uh, um, very, uh, not, not, uh, not in Vietnam. So uh, I think uh, it's not only the matter of training or education, it's also the matter of the economy because if the people uh, want to, uh, to study something new for the new economy, but uh, the economy is not changing accordingly. So the, what they learn is not relevant in the labor market uh, right now. So, I, uh, so that's some of the, the, my talk about our situation. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you, Ms. Pam. Thank you, uh, Lin Sin, for, for the question. This just emphasized the role of education in, in our preparedness also to, to be uh, in, in the labor market, but uh, it, it also ties us to what is education and employment for in this time and age. And um, these reflections also enrich us uh, uh, by, by the question that you asked Dr. Lee, I will um, return to you. Um, there is a question here um, directed to you that in Malaysia, the rate of tertiary educated students has exceeded the rate of high-skilled job creation. Given such job trend, may I know what are the key problems that cause this mismatch? How should we tackle it? Okay. Uh, yeah. So, yes. Uh, this the the supply of tertiary educated uh, students um, ex exceeding the uh, generation of, of uh, high skilled jobs or those that 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 we would consider as uh, on par with with those uh, qualifications. I think we ask questions on both sides, and I think firstly, and I think not not enough is being asked about why 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 not enough a high skilled uh, job uh, creation. Uh, this um, you know is is a just a sort of a, this is a perennial problem. It's been done. It's it's been asked and 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 attempted for at least two to three uh, decades, um, and it is not not necessarily and i think in some ways not so much more much more related to other policies than than uh than uh, education about labor policies about um you know the continuous uh dependence on uh low, low wage and, and low skill uh employment or investment in in uh in, in those kinds of uh industries so i think this is something that um will need to be you know asked in terms of uh why is malaysia why are southeast asian countries what is the scope i mean i know there's you know it's uh it's it's a big challenge and and i think in this COVID time as bima was saying uh the situation right the the the, the the urgency of uh, unemployment, you know, has shifted in some ways uh, uh, a reversal of, I think, the policy that was supposed to go to, you know, away from labor intensity, but now towards more labor, labor, labor intensity. Uh, but I think, uh, yeah, for Malaysia, the question still is, you know, the scope for uh, for pursuing uh, sectors um, in. Uh, uh, green economy, for instance, you know, even with a lot of that discourse happening globally, it's I find it's not really making you know not not really uh, gaining as much traction, not really putting place at the center of Malaysia, where I think there you could really marry quite a few uh, different objectives for skilled jobs, new growth uh, sectors, right? Um, and, and, and quality uh, quality jobs that uh, you know youth could be either readily uh, trained being having the, the you know the capacity to be trained for something new or they, there should be a, also some supply and to launch into new sectors where you can then also uh, integrate to the education uh, system this kind of you know planning, uh, I think it's, it's really been uh, lacking. Whether or not, okay, so on the supply side, whether or not um, uh, this bigger question of the oversupply um, is, is, is a difficult one to answer. I mean, the numbers would say that, yes, there are too many, right? But then how do you break it down? Uh, for, for some, yes, because, because the number of jobs and the, the, the transferability is a bit more limited, like doctors. And this is a real case in Malaysia where there's been too many and you can't just set up, easily set up, you know, more hospitals and, and clinics. So there's been that, uh, that, that's more of a clearer cut case. You know, in, in some others, I go back to the question of uh, earlier, right? What do youth do? in that critical, you know, the formative years of 18 to, to 20. 
And uh, if a society will, you know, will still lean towards them, they should be in more of a full-time uh, learning, right? Um, then we really need to just address, you know, how to make that more engaging, more, you know, more, um, more, more effective, um, or for the skills tracks to make, um, you know, academic training uh, more, more versatile. So a lot of these conversations are taking place and I don't really have like a very, you know, PowerPointed answer about what needs to be to be done. Uh, but I think I would still lean on the side of, you know, tertiary education um, uh, is important and, uh, and not to be too uh, simplistic about the question of uh, uh, unemployed graduates or, uh, or labeling that as a question, a problem of uh, oversupply. I think uh, they, many should probably still be engaged in tertiary education. But let's just try and you know make it uh, make them uh, employable rather than say, don't do tertiary education. Thank you. Um, this is a question to all our uh, panelists, um, and we'll start with you, Mr. Bima. This time, this is from Sergio Grassi. How do you expect an investment incentive race to the bottom in the region because of the COVID-19 crisis? And do you expect a positive impact on youth employment by ratifying RCEP? Okay, thank you very much. So a lot of the country giving uh, fiscal incentive uh, and non-fiscal incentive yeah, in the labor intensive. So. If we right now or today we're talking about the future of works with it with uh, more technological advance, yeah, we see some backward, backward uh, with the government policy, especially in Indonesia. So rather than talking about the industrial revolution, no one talking about industrial revolution from the government uh, perspective, uh, especially uh, when they're talking with the expert or public uh, uh, opinion. Yeah. So this is the problem. If we look, we want to absorb uh, more employment during this uh, crisis, even maybe two or three years, but uh, some of the work right is reduced and then become, uh, that's kind of a stimulus to bring more investment. It didn't work at all. Why? We, we already tried previously. We have 16 economic packages before the pandemic and government give a lot of fiscal incentive to bring more investment, especially uh, due to threat war between the US and China, but no one uh, want to come to Indonesia. No, no single company relocate to Indonesia. Thankfully, there's a Vietnam. Yeah? <laughs> they, they move uh, Vietnam and Thailand rather than Indonesia. So zero company move to Indonesia. Although we're giving a lot of the incentive. So we need to rethink again about what kind of the incentive. Do, do we want uh, just uh, quantity of the labor or massive employment opportunity or we want also the quality of the employment, the, the future of uh, work that uh, consists of the youth that involve in the high-tech uh, export for instance or high adding value uh, company or a high adding value product that we can export uh, worldwide. So that's a big question. And the second one is uh, related to the RCEP. Before uh, Indonesia is not yet ratified the RCEP. Before we ratified the RCEP, uh, the Chinese uh, company come to Indonesia. They especially doing the extractive work, yeah, uh, for the nickel and then for the coal, for the some of them in the palm oil business. Yeah, uh, we see the adding value for the Indonesia is uh, relatively small. And then they bring a lot of uh, foreign worker using the visa tourist rather than a foreign worker proper uh, visa. So this is also creating a problem just before RCEP. Can, can we imagine if we sign the RCEP, I think uh, there's no opportunity for the, the local talent uh, youth, but rather than uh, from the foreign uh, company and then the foreign country uh, talented youth that come to Indonesia because we already liberalized the uh, foreign worker regulation before we signed the RCEP treaty. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Pam? 
can you repeat the question because I'm out for some minutes. Oh, sorry. Um, the question is, do you expect an investment incentive raised to the bottom in the region because of the COVID-19 crisis? Do you expect a positive impact on youth employment by ratifying RCEP? RCTP? RCEP. RCEP. We can return to you, Miss Pam. Um, if if you're still thinking about it, it's it's um, it's it's no worries. Um, I I I'll return to you. So just so you can settle, um, Doctor Lee. Okay, I won't say too much because I've been talking a lot. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I just want to add one more thing. Uh, one more point about. Uh, the COVID-19 or maybe I guess two points. I mean, I, I think if country, it, it depends, right? Whether this race to the bottom, how much uh, standards have already been formalized and are, you know, and, and workers are conscious uh, of that, uh, of, of their rights. I think it's, it's, it's hard, it, it is hard to, to roll them back. I mean, even in a time like this, or perhaps even more in a time like this, where there's a great uh, insecurity, you know, and, and I think a lot of anxiety. I think people will really push against erosion of standards and, and rights. But the other aspect about uh, COVID-19 is that even with incentives that may um, be, uh, may, you know, target or may have the result, right, of a lot of, you know, low wage labor intensive jobs, for countries like you know uh, Malaysia, probably applicable to Thailand, because it's so hard to uh, for foreign uh, right migrant uh, labor to enter, which are the ones that are filling up those jobs, then I, I think it, it that may actually be a certain uh, constraint on on uh, that kind of uh, negative effect, uh, kind of uh, race race to, to to the bottom. Thank you. I hope I am not um, missing out um, questions um, that were, were typed. But for, for a last question, uh, maybe to all of you, and I will start with Ms. Pam on this. You can, you can of course, um, comment on the, on the earlier question and also tie this to, to, uh, to our last question. If there are no questions anymore that will be typed um, in, in our chat box, um, the, the, the landscape is changing and it's not changing um, as you have, as you have um, pointed in your presentation. It's changing because it is forcing um, uh, different trends, but certainly things, there are certain things that are not changing in employment landscape. And uh, these are the vulnerabilities um, that are still there and the non-protection of of workers, especially of, of young people. So the challenges on training and education and priorities are, are, are coming up. Um, um, what do you uh, think about collectivization um, and um, stronger organizations and structures um, that would involve, um, of course, the, the working people and young working people, of course, um, uh, as, as we move forward, because there are, there are strategies that will be rolled out by, by governments. There are still commitments that we have yet to realize, as pointed out by Ms. Pam earlier. But how do we get better um, organized and what structures should be there um, so that the new normal future of work will be pro-worker? Um, uh, and, and future oriented at the same time as well, addressing problems that we have now and problems that may occur in the future. Um, um, we can start with you, Ms. Pam, and then Mr. Bima, and then um, Dr. Lee. Uh, uh, yes, I think that um, uh, the situation is changing. And the economy is uh, changing with the industrial uh, 4.0, and uh, uh, I think for and for the worker, workers should know their rights. In Vietnam now, we have a new uh, labor code, 
the revised one, which uh, allow for uh, workers uh, to organize uh, independently. And that means uh, at the moment in Vietnam, there is only a trade union which organize the workers, but uh, uh, since uh, 2021, the worker have the right to organize uh, independently outside the trade union if they want. So um, uh, sure, surely that uh, worker need to to act collectively, to voice their opinion, and they uh, 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 organize themselves. But uh, in order for them to organize themselves, uh, they need to be aware of their right. And they need to be aware of the tools, how they can use, uh, especially collective uh, bargaining. Uh, they need to have uh, been trained with the negotiation skills, uh, collective bargaining skills, and organizing skills uh, and um, not only that the law uh, systems also uh, need to be uh, need to, to protect the workers in terms of uh, uh, anti-discrimination act or interference act of, uh, because uh, in Vietnam it, it may have a very good law but uh, enforcement of the law uh, is still a matter of concern so uh, many uh, acts of discrimination is a very uh, difficult, difficult uh, to uh, deal with uh, in the law system because uh, uh, the employer can uh, uh, use other reason to explain if they uh, dismiss the workers, uh, it's not because the worker organized or not the, because the workers uh, uh, join the uh, union uh, it's because of other reason and it's uh, difficult to uh, settle it at the moment. Uh, so I think the legal advice for workers should be enhanced, uh, the protection for workers should be enhanced and also the uh, conciliations and arbitration uh, system in our country also need to be advanced uh, for uh, for the workers to to voice, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That is uh, Miss Pam T. Tulan from from Vietnam. Thank you for joining us this afternoon, Mr. Bima. Yeah, the first one is uh, if we're talking about the future of work and industrial revolution 4.0, that the trade union and civil society also become 4.0. Because uh, what we've seen so far, uh, trade unions still using their conventional way to uh, campaign and then to open dialogue uh, to the government. And even some trade union is not prepared to have a solution for the, uh, let's say, changing of the landscape of the workplace. And the second one, I think uh, both the trade union, uh, civil society, and academia must stand together during this uh, I think this uh, difficult time or difficult uh, momentum that we see that some of the government, I don't know specific uh, in Asian country, but uh, for Indonesia, we need uh, international solidarity to tell the government that uh, it is not correct that you decrease the right of the worker and then safeguard of the environment to attract more investment and to bring uh, the quality of the job. So I think that's uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you. That is Mr. Bima Yudhistira from, from Indonesia. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Dr. Lee? Yes, thanks, Makris. Uh, well, you brought up the same question that I had raised as a question. Uh, so, you know, I, I, I have very half big thoughts uh, about this, but I had alluded earlier that, and I like the way that uh, you, the term they use is collectivization, right? Um, so not limited to unionization and especially not in, uh, in the industrial mode with shop floors, you know, and, and masses of workers and then bargaining in, 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 a, in a more uh, straightforward manner in the sense of right, workers being represented and what are you bargaining over? I think uh, there's changes which really do call for collectivization, but still the collectivization and representation on the worker side. I mean, for self-employed, they may be self-employed, but they're also up against, you know, the, in the supply chain, 
right? So, so yeah, I mean, not necessarily it has to take the form of unionization, I think would be my main point, but to explore ways for, you know, um, yeah, for, for, for collectivization and, um, you know, for, for the workers that self-employed to be, uh, to have ownership over their terms, over what they're paid, over the fees that they charge and, uh, and so on, including for, you know, the, the, the craft, those classified as craft workers. I think that's one big area that, that uh, is a major uh, gap where there's, you know, no um, avenue for, for them to collectivize. Thank you, Dr. Lee walk on for joining us this afternoon. Our, our panelists uh, provided very interesting insights and um, really this is a, a very good discussion on um, the perspective of youth um, on the future of work in the new normal. Um, I hope you've learned a lot. I did learn a lot. Um, the, the landscape in Indonesia, um, Malaysia, uh, Vietnam and of course also a reflection on different countries um, at the moment. It is not only that we are in the face of the pandemic um, because there are problems, vulnerabilities and inadequacies that are there um, even before and I believe even after the, the pandemic is resolved. And our speakers pointed out that of course it's education, education training coping, adapting with the changes in the employment um, um, and economic um, landscape. That's, there's no getting around it, um, but having foundations and fundamentals. But foundations and fundamentals in education is not enough without principles or ethos on how we treat work or how we treat um, um, labor. Um, but certainly uh, for us, there also has to be um, very clear um, um, knowledge of problems that I think were clearly identified by our speakers and elements of um, at addressing these, these problems um, at the moment. And it all uh, boils down into, into creating jobs, but answering what types of jobs. It boils to income, earning, but how much do we earn and how fair would the earnings be for, for working people? And um, for us to uh, move forward, it also involves um, changing traditional ways or conventional ways because times are changing, the landscapes are changing. So education, training, industry, and collective organizing has to also change to be able to, to respond to the challenges. Thank you to our speakers, Dr. Lee, Mr. Bima, Ms. Pam. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. And um, I'll turn uh, over to Ivy um, from REFSA. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Macris from SOCDEM Asia. Thank you, Macris. Thank you so much for a very, very wonderful uh, discussions. Uh, thank you to our panel speakers as well, Dr. Lee, Ms. Tam, and also Mr. Bima. Uh, that will conclude our session today uh, on the youth perspective uh, for the future of work. Before we go, I would like to inform uh, all of you, all our participants, that uh, after we end these sessions, we will be having a breakout sessions uh, where you can uh, actually have further chats and further discussion with our speakers. Um, so if you would like to join us for these sessions, please use the raise hand function uh, at the bottom of the bottom panel and our technical team will add you into the uh, group chat. I'm sorry that we can't provide you coffee and cakes uh, as we usually will have during a physical uh, post sessions uh, networking session, but I hope that you will benefit from the opportunity to talk directly to our speakers. Um, I would also like to inform you that uh, tomorrow we will, still, we will still have another session that will be our final uh, sessions on the labor response. Uh, please do join us for the last day. I believe that my colleague will be sending the uh, details uh, on the chat very soon. 
and uh, you can also find that on Refsa's uh, website, refsa.org. So with that, I would like to thank you all of you very much. I hope you have a good rest of the day or rest of the evening, evening. And I look forward to see you again tomorrow. Thank you. Okay. Hi. All right. Okay. Sorry. Um, I guess we are we are ready to go into our breakout sessions. Um, I was told that Sergio has something to say. Is that right? Okay, yeah, I think I've, I've, seen, um, I've seen a few people being added, so okay, that's great. So, um, Sergio, maybe you want to kick off the sessions? Maybe some remarks from you? Is Sergio still there? Just coming back, I was kicked out <laughs> by Indonesian Telecom, I guess. No problem. Any thoughts about the session, Sergio? Yeah, I mean, it was a quite interesting perspective uh, from the use. Um, I guess the areas we have touched also in the previous days, like the gig economy, like uh, the, the investment incentive education, but not with a particular perspective from the use, uh, which I think would be the most vulnerable of some um, long-term trends that we are currently observing and uh, COVID might even accelerate. Um, and uh, maybe, Allow me the comment on uh, Hock An's presentation at the very beginning. I was quite surprised how low the salaries in Malaysia are in average. I mean, if that is the current situation, um, that it will be, it, I think it will be very scary if uh, it is even more negatively um, affected by COVID-19 and some other trends that we are currently observing. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I took off my headset. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it, it really is. Uh, you know, it's, I, I find it still perplexing how low wages are and, and uh, the low uh, growth. And, and people really do struggle. And uh, so, uh, you know, the, and the video, I, um, I, I think most saw it, uh, you know, was, was uh, at the at the beginning, um, I think really uh, put faces to it. You know, you could really hear uh, the, uh, the the experience, right? Uh, convey um, how minimum wage at one thousand two hundred. You know, this is it. Just is such a such a struggle. It's so so inadequate. And, yeah, median uh, wage of one thousand five hundred ringgit. That is like three hundred euro huh? or four hundred dollars maybe mm -hmm. a month mm -hmm. that is tough yeah. but uh, i mean i think for the malaysian economy as an external observer to uh raise salaries in the future apart from changing your labor policies with uh, a lot of foreign workers also coming 
to Malaysia. Um, I think it needs also to have a refocus on um, other economic sectors. Huh? Like fossil fuels seems not to be any more the most promising sector um, for the next years. Tourism um, is also not very promising for the future. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting also to hear from you what uh, would be your recommendation in, in uh, terms of industrial sectors for Malaysia, where the youth could find uh, better quality jobs. Yeah, I I think uh, the yeah the, the, these are just very very preliminary uh, thoughts, um, you know, and I think it's partly also you know driven I think by what I I know I feel are the imperatives of uh, climate change. Um, I, just a few weeks, maybe two weeks ago, there was uh, this storm in in uh, KL. And yeah. if people know the Masjid Jami, right? The confluence, Kuala Lumpur, the confluence, the muddy yeah. confluence, right? The center, and it's iconic. Um, and it was like it was, it, it yeah, it, it was just a real uh, picture uh, of you know how it became like an I island. It was almost uh, flooded. Maybe it was at the at the the water was lapping at the steps. Um, Climate change is one of those, you know, that I guess we need really the somehow the disasters only then we respond. Uh, they are kind of accumulating a bit in Malaysia, more in terms of flooding. So it's not, uh, I guess what I'm saying is that, yeah, so it, it's, you know, not really reached that level of, of alarm that is a national galvanizing all that energy. But I think it's just, it's that imperative. But I think it, and I think it's the way that also provides a lot of opportunities. You know, if it's you're going to be greening buildings, if it's going to be about um, the, making infrastructure more, uh, you know, sustainable, um, you know, consistent with, you know, lifestyle changes. In, so that would cut, cut across some manufacturing um, you know, construction, um, re uh, refitting buildings, um, you know, the, uh, how the whole, you know, um, food supply chain and, and that business, which also would fit in with uh, self, uh, more, more self-sufficiency. Um, these are, yeah, just, just a few uh, thoughts, which, yeah, I think, uh, you know, many minds need to come together then to really, to, to, to thrash it out. But I think food, Malaysians love food. So, you know, it's always, <laughs> and there's always potential there. Hi, Dr. Lee. I thought to chime in at this point. Uh, it's Farhana. Uh, Farhana Ruslan. Hi, hi, Dr. Lee. Uh, long time no see. Um, I want to, so on that point, actually the, the 2018 Bank Nagara Annual Report has a, has a really beautiful box on this analysis of um, of why workers are feeling like they they didn't they're not getting compensated enough, whereas uh, employers are feeling that they um, are, are paying too high. I mean they they cannot um, they cannot um, pay more more. So uh, and it's in the function of the the price that they can sell their products for. Oh sorry. Let me just. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Um, and, <laughs> Um, so the um, the question is then like I know I know you mentioned earlier that you know we, we should not look um, past the manufacturing sector and crafts and the, so and that that is definitely not those sectors that are, are going to pay more. So do you mean that in really the really the very very short term uh, in facing COVID, just because our manufacturing base is just so huge, or is there ways to look at those sectors going forward still? since we're looking at this high, you know, going for innovation, high tech, reducing uh, dependency on low, low skill workers and, and just moving up the value chain and, and just dealing with, um, you know, the notion of not, not reducing cost of living, rather, you know, increasing wages. I just, just wanted to pinpoint that, that, that piece you, you mentioned about crafts um, and, and manufacturing. Yeah. Uh, um. So I think uh, the manufacturing uh, was arising in a few contexts. Uh, one was that it's not to be uh, not to be uh, <clears throat> omitted as we think about 
a lot of emphasis on services. And um, just recently we released the manufacturing data was showing that there was this increase of 60,000 in June and then July, uh, decrease of 60,000 jobs in manufacturing, that's only uh, manufacturing. Um, so more, more, more uh, directly about the COVID current uh, situation. Um, <clears throat> but in general, I mean, um, I think I would agree with the need to, to re-industrialize. Not necessarily, yeah, to become, you know, uh, for it to rapidly rise up to be uh, is share of GDP, but to look out for the sectors that are, you know, in line with that vision for, because manufacturing, you know, continually uh, uh, has the linkages, the spillovers, the export potential, the scope to uh, innovate and is actually you know, making uh, products. Um, you could be making the capital goods, the, the machinery or the inputs into other products in, in the supply chain. Um, yeah, so I, I don't really, um, not at the point of really, you know, pinpointing, um, you know, that where specifically the investments um, uh, need, need to go. But in terms of strategy, uh, I think, yeah, it's, it's still really uh, vital as the jobs, again, for the technological uh, spillovers, sort of the, the capacity for, uh, for, for innovation. And it is a really serious matter that, you know, the problem of prematurity industrialization, that uh, if you, countries that start to, where there's manufacturing sectors role in the economy, contribution to output and employment declines at an early stage before it's really achieved the technological advancement and high wages, that is, uh, you know, then really risking the, uh, staying stuck in this middle income uh, situation. For, for crafts, uh, it is, um, I mean, there is that data that's showing for, for the you know, immediate employment of, uh, of, of graduates, the tracer study, that uh, some of those specific jobs, right, electricians, which do require skill, whether formally trained or not, in this case, they are trained, because they are graduates, um, that it, it's, it, it pays one of the better ones among the self-employed. Um, I mean, I think career long, then it may, others will supersede and right, will, will, uh, will, the earnings might surpass that. But I think that's where the, the, we need to give some attention to making those, you know, those kind of uh, careers for services, I think that will continually be, uh, be around. This is an area that, you know, is sort of, um, yeah, there, there will be a ready market. I mean, maybe, maybe less so people become a little bit more DIY and do your own, but you know, there will still be, yeah, you know, jobs that, that uh, I don't think can be so easily, aut you know, automated, right? Um, and, and that's where maybe giving, uh, you know, allowing for, for the formation of, for an, uh, of, of guilds and, and where these, you know, workers in this craft, in these trades, um, you know, can, can collectivize, you know, could, could be certainly something I think worth exploring. They probably do exist, you know, and, and we have so many cooperatives and all that, but I'm just not, I don't, I don't, they're not certainly, they're certainly not really translating into a lot of impact for um, better, income and, and work conditions for the crops. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Hokan, just now you mentioned something about uh, green economy and climate change as well. Um, so, RESA actually recently published a paper uh, on job creation uh, for the green economy. I mean, we also did one on healthcare and education, but essentially we are stealing the terms from Mariana Mazzucato to trying to talk about sort of the mission-oriented approach. So, um, but yeah, Dashan, who is here, who is the author, I think he is here. So maybe uh, if Dashan wants to say something, he can. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that one of the things that we discover is also that obviously there's a lot of jobs that can be created. 
um, in the green economy, um, but they are also not, not, necess not necessarily high skill jobs. Obviously, there's a lot of high skill jobs that can be created, um, but there's also a sort of a lower level jobs um, as well. So yeah, I mean, Hashin, if you want to say something uh, about this, and also I realized that Jaigun, one of our speakers from yesterday on gig economy is here as well. So maybe if you want to chime in some perspectives about um, these subjects, I mean, just in general, not in green economy, you can as well. Yeah, so um, I recently wrote a paper with Refsa um, highlighting different areas of the green economy where we could look to stimulate job creation. Um, and one of those areas that uh, we chose to focus on was renewable energy. So Malaysia is already one of the largest producers of photovoltaic panels in the world. So there's definitely the expertise here. The big, the big issue is that there are no local champions in photovoltaic production. So with the right um, incentives and government support, maybe we could take steps in that direction. Another area that um, we looked at was agriculture and uh, so, uh, things that would improve our long-term food security. So amongst the recommendations we had was greater emphasis on vertical farming, uh, as well as um, investments that can upskill our current farmers and uh, use more modern and, and, and advanced farming systems and techniques. Um, and then other areas where Malaysia has a lot of potential is in biofuels as well. As one of the largest producers of palm oil, we have a lot of um, feedstock readily available for, um, to boost the biofuels industry. And as well as in transport where we have two local champions really, two big local car manufacturers. And if they were to invest in, let's say electric vehicles, uh, it could really help propel um, electric vehicles becoming more of a mass market product rather than one that's targeted just for higher income families. So that's some aspects to the green economy where we could stimulate job growth and economic growth as well at the same time. Uh, uh, yes, this is again here. Oh, hang on. Uh. Yep. Okay. So I think uh, just to reflect on what uh, On was talking about, I think uh, the threat of uh, premature deindustrialization, de right, in the country. So, uh, and then also I think reflecting on what um, Dashan was talking about. Okay, right, in building a new green uh, industry. So currently I'm working, and I think some who were around yesterday, I'm working on a research project with MIT on understanding technology adoption right, in Malaysia uh, manufacturing. And what we found that, uh, at least very preliminarily, is the question that perhaps the bottleneck is not so much on, uh, uh, not just the sort of talent of workers end, right? Because on the other end, uh, when companies and uh, manufacturing firms are not moving up uh, the value chain or not uh, adopting new technology to increase productivity and so on, uh, what you have left with is, uh, and, and also some kind of middle management in factories who are not familiar with new technologies or new industries, um, so that the younger or youth workers that walk in uh, uh, might feel that you might want to do something new but you can't, right, because the companies or there are no companies that are looking ahead. There are some, very few. Uh, MNCs, large companies, but the vast majority of Malaysian manufacturing are SMEs, and they are the ones who are kind of stagnating in terms of uh, technology uh, 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 levels. So I think on the other end, how, how to tackle that problem is also how can we get our manufacturing firms right, to be more ambitious and to, to move up the value chain instead of uh, doing what they have been doing for the last uh, 20, 20 years. Um, so, so I think that that, that, that is another part uh, when we talk about manufacturing, which is still perhaps the most stable, best job compared to the very, uh, more, more very in, much more informal, volatile gig economy work with no less skills training. Um, uh, and so manufacturing firms have that. And I think the second idea, which um, perhaps slowly fading away, but still there, is the question of having very cheap foreign workers, right? When, uh, when you have this pool of workers there, I do not need to, go, to, to use new technology, right? Uh, if I have a new machine, 
and get a new uh, young graduate, Malaysian graduate, he, had, he or she has to learn how to use the machine itself. I might as well hire 20 foreign workers to do it manually. So, so these are the considerations that, that, that on the firm point of view, that has to be tackled too, when we look at uh, not just the talent generation and, and, and what uh, they can be trained to do, but also on the firm level, or what, how, how we can get our companies, and in fact, train our employers to be more sensitive and more aware of what's happening globally. And, and, and our interviews still seem to feel that uh, unless you are more a, a startup, younger company, or a larger MNC, the rest of them kind of, you know, is still quite uh, in the dark in, in, in terms of what's really happening out there. So, so I think, yeah, this is how I see it, it will impact uh, uh, the, 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 the uh, slowing down the manufacturing sector. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Yi Han. Uh, the Executive Director of REFSA. First of all, thank you very much for to the speakers and moderators uh, for participating in this. Uh, Hokon, it's good to see you again virtually, even though it's been a while. Uh, I'm probably not going to switch on my video, I'm <laughs> not dressed for that. And, and you may hear a bit of background noise from my kids, so apologies. This is a new working from home uh, uh, normal. Um, rather than asking a question, I think I just wanted to share a bit of my, my thoughts after uh, hearing the entire, entire session. And also to bring, um, bring it back to the first session that we were talking with uh, Jomo and uh, uh, Prof Jayati and Dr No. Um, I felt that personally, to a large extent, the issue is a bit more systematic than we would like to you know, acknowledge in terms of the, in terms of the failure of uh, identifying the, the issues that the youth are going to be facing and perhaps even more so in the coming, in the coming year or two. Um, specifically looking at the, the way, so for my own experience, the way that the government has so far identified the unemployment rates, uh, it seems that uh, uh, they have been quite um, optimistic uh, given that the headline figures has, has dropped from 5.3% to 4.9% in the, in the previous few months. So I thought that's something that I do not know if there are other sort of um, commentators from other countries, if you would like to share, uh, how has the government dealt with this? I felt that to a large extent, that is a key issue. Uh, but whether how are we going to address this together as policymakers? If anybody has any views, I would like to hear about it. Certainly from REFSA, we continue to highlight uh, that the headline numbers are not something to be extremely proud of because as the numbers that are being shown from Hong on, um, there are a lot of uh, 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 real, real groundwork issues that are not being, that are not being reflected uh, in the numbers. Separately, bringing it to the first session, um, we are talking about a, a more government, government should be intervening more or a more whole of society approach in dealing all this. So I suppose to a large extent, the first thing that, that policymakers need to be aware of and perhaps work on is to increase the awareness uh, of this specific issue. Uh, clearly recently, I think it was just yesterday or the day before, Kazana Research Institute has also put out their, uh, their teaser for their flagship household report. So looking forward to that as well. Uh, but this is just sharing my thought uh, rather than having a specific question. So if anybody have anything to add, please, please go ahead. Yep. Um, I don't know the rest of the people here uh, except for Eileen, who is a fellow Malaysian currently based in the UK. Uh, and then I see some of you. I, I'm just going to make a guess that you're from Indonesia based on your name. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you have anything to respond to whether Ihan's uh, point or anything in general. No? <laughs> No, can I add? No, I'm, I'm very curious. Yeah, I mean, uh, in the, about, uh, yeah, for Indonesia, uh, maybe Philippines, like how credible, you know, are the, how, how do people regard the, the official statistics? Um, so, okay, so uh, on my part, I, I think we, we, most of us, I think, were expecting, and I think justifiably, 
uh, that you know unemployment right would really escalate, and uh, but and then maybe there was some part as well that I was thinking it's really hard to do the surveying uh, under uh, the restrictions. Um, I think there was about 15% that was done computer aided, but from what I gather, mostly it was still face to face dropping in on, on, on the homes. So I, yeah, I, I guess I, uh, eventually I just kind of had to re put it all together and say that it, it really seems to be quite credible. And then you don't really see that, you know, what were the other sources that we could refer to that maybe uh, it's, it's not, yeah, that, that could uh, satisfy, I guess, the doubts that the unemployment situation was worse than the numbers were showing, right? I mean, max at 5.3 went down to a 4.9, 4.7, it has uh, stabilized. So, yeah, I mean, I think there still needs to be questions that are asked about it, but, I, but at the same time, I think it's, you know, the, it, we, we're not seeing a lot of other evidence to really over, uh, over, uh, overturn or to say that it's, it's far, far, far more worse than, than what it's showing. I mean, it's still quite serious at 4.7%, uh, uh, um, but I am curious about the other, uh, what other experiences might be in other countries. Yeah, if I can step in here just for a second. Um, I guess one thing that we'll have to keep in mind is what the, how the size of the, how the size of what is defined as the labor force has changed as a result of, of COVID-19, whether a lot of people have dropped out of the labor market entirely, because when they calculate their unemployment rates, this is gonna be a key factor in that. And then this is something else that we spoke about in a breakout session a couple of days ago, was that we have no indication of what the quality of employment is now compared to how it was before COVID-19. So hourly workers, um, uh, if, if they work one hour a month or something, they're, they're considered to be employed. So maybe if we have some data on um, how many hours people are working now compared to how, how many hours they were working before, we could maybe have uh, you know, better qual quality evidence to decide what our next step should be. Okay, if uh, no one else has anything to add, uh, maybe we can close this session now. So thank you so much for staying, staying on. I think that was uh, fun to get to talk to each other. So, and if, if there's anyone else that anything to say, you can do that. But otherwise, uh, we can maybe close this session. Thank you, everyone, for participating. Thank you. Hopefully, we'll see Thank you. Thank you very much. Tomorrow, which is the last session. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Han. Thank you, Sergio. Hold on to you, Thank you Olga. When I'm next in Singapore, I don't know when, to be honest. Oh. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Lan, Thank you, for Marcus. joining today.